This is part two of this series on forsaking penal substitutionary atonement. Uh, in part one of the series, we'll give you a little recap here. I established some of the theological reasons why penal substitution is problematic and why I personally reject the theory. Uh, these included reflections on the nature of God's justice, whether it is retributive or restorative in the light of Christ's teachings. We concluded that retributive justice is rejected by Christ, and thus we must discipline our concept of justice according to the teachings of Jesus, particularly his words about the lex talionis. I also argued that PSA portrays the cross as a violent transaction taking place over our heads, wherein God merely balances some sort of internal ledger rather than healing our fallen humanity and overcoming sin. In short, that God was the object of the atonement, not the one who acts for our atonement. We also discussed the problematic notion that the Son was forsaken by the Father and rejected any atonement narrative that creates a wedge between the divine persons. Finally, we briefly considered some of the pastoral effects of PSA, uh, particularly how it has led to a disastrous image of God the Father as angry and hostile in contrast with Jesus the Son, who is merciful and gracious. PSA thus fundamentally works against the very heart and message of the gospel. The message of reconciliation and it does so by making the father that from which we are saved rather than the one who acts for our good thus psa taints the very goal of the atonement so that it is no longer a relational union with god but a legal transaction at its center all of these points were to show that psa is theologically problematic especially in relation to the doctrine of god and so on those grounds, theologically, we must reject it. Today, however, I want to expand upon those arguments by looking at the specific proof text that proponents of PSA often try to use and defend the doctrine. As we'll soon see, it is a clear case for me of injecting into the scriptures an abstractly legal and transactional framework when a case can be made that the authors held no such concept of the atonement. But PSA is an interpretation of those passages. In fact, every atonement theory is an interpretation, and I'm of the opinion that the New Testament has no single systematic atonement theory at all, um, but we'll return to that point later on. But my main argument here is that these texts that are classically used by defenders of PSA actually have no concept of the doctrine, but that we can read those same verses in a way that's not only more accurate to what the authors intended, but is also more theologically consistent with the God who is revealed in Jesus Christ. So let's get that straight from the start. PSA is a theory. It is an interpretation of the scriptures. These texts do not state explicitly the doctrine of PSA, even if their proponents assume otherwise. It is a classic case of eisegesis versus exegesis, of reading into a text what one sees rather than deriving from the text its meaning. Of course, everyone comes to the scriptures with theological presuppositions, but on the grounds that I've articulated in the previous video, we have good hermeneutical reasons to deny that any of these verses necessarily point to PSA. So my method here is primarily theological. I'm not a biblical scholar, even though I will rely on a number of biblical scholars for this argument, um, but I primarily interpret these texts as a theologian aiming for a systematic interpretation and not a textual one. Now, of course, the textual and the theological necessarily uh, coincide, but I point that out mostly to stress um, that I think the notion of biblical theology, what's, what's called a biblical theology, uh, wherein we simply read and interpret texts at their face value, that that's not my goal. And as a whole, I'm, I'm mostly skeptical of this idea of biblical theology, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, the point is that well-respected biblical scholars have read these same passages and come to very different interpretations. So it is naive to look at these texts and say, the Bible clearly teaches PSA, because that is just not the case. Brilliant exegetes, including many of the church fathers, have read these very same texts and did not conclude in PSA. And so the scriptures do not clearly teach penal substitutionary atonement. And that brings up another important point to contextualize this argument. The theory of penal substitution is a new one. As much as its proponents will try to place it before Anselm in the 12th century, it finds no proponents in the early church as it is specifically formulated by its defenders. 
It may be possible to discern a kind of proto-PSA in earlier authors, but you will not find a single systematic presentation of this theory before Anselm. But that's enough for the introduction. Uh, let's now turn and look at these proof texts that are often held up by defenders of PSA. The first text is often considered the most significant, and that is not only because it comes from Paul's masterpiece in the New Testament, but because it contains one of the most obvious examples, in their minds at least, of PSA. This text is from Romans 3. Let's read verses 21 through 26. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed, and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, or through the faith of Jesus Christ, for all who believe. For there is no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus or who has the faith of Jesus. Now, this passage is from the New Revised Standard Version, which is commonly held to be the most ecumenical and scholarly translation. But in the ESV, the English Standard Version, which is a standard translation for the evangelical and reformed, this verse is rendered drastically different. The critical passage here is verse 25. In the ESV, beginning with verse 23, we read, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood, to be received by faith. The key word here is propitiation. In English, this means the same as to appease or placate with the particular connotation of appeasing a god through a sacrificial act that averts the wrath of God. Now, the scholarship is divided about this issue. The Greek word for this can be translated in a number of ways, but the debate has been typically around whether or not Paul means propitiation or expiation. That is, whether or not propitiation, meaning divine appeasement, versus expiation, meaning a sin covering or cleansing. Thus, we are again at a theological crossroad between the notions of retributive justice or restorative justice, which I discussed in the first video. Either we conceptualize God's justice according to the lex talionis, or the law of retaliation, that is, as if God is demanding an eye for an eye, or we learn from Christ, who explicitly rejected that kind of justice and defined God's justice as restorative, as being aimed not towards payment, not towards punishment, but towards healing and restoration. So it really comes down to your theological framework, what you will decide in translating this verse. But in my interpretation, it is more theologically accurate to say that God's justice is restorative and not retributive, because Christ rejected retributive justice, and thus I think it is theologically more precise to translate this word as expiation. The Greek word here is halasteron, and the most literal translation of it is mercy seat, which implies a covering over sin. It is thus rooted historically in the Hebraic concept of the Day of Atonement. New Testament scholar Joseph Fitzmaier, in his commentary on Romans for the Anchor Yale Bible, makes the same conclusion. Halasteron is better understood against the background of the Septuagint usage of the Day of Atonement rite, so it would depict Christ as the new mercy seat presented or displayed by the Father as a means of expiating or wiping away the sins of humanity. Indeed, as the place of the presence of God, of his revelation, and of his expiating power. Furthermore, David Bentley Hart, in his celebrated translation of the New Testament, renders this word along the same lines as simply place of atonement. So in the context, Paul is saying that God set forth Jesus Christ as a place of atonement through faith in his blood. Both Hart and Fitzmaier alike also note that this word has a special historical context and thus must be narrowly translated according to the Jewish tradition of the mercy seat that covered the Ark of the Covenant and was thus the place of atonement. Thus the word in no way denotes a sacrificial offering to appease divine wrath, but rather it is a covering of sin. The object of the sacrifice, or that which is acted upon by it, is sin itself, 
and not the wrath of God. So whatever is going on here, it is clear that the focus is not on appeasing God, but on covering sin. Now, of course, there are reform scholars who argue that precisely because of this historical background, that is why it needs to be rendered propitiation. We'll get to the Jewish context in a little bit, uh, but the point is that this is again a hermeneutical decision, a choice of interpretation. It is ultimately debatable whether or not this should be translated propitiation, expiation, place of atonement, or even just mercy seat. And so all of these translations are pushing a particular theological point that may or may not be inherent in the text. Thus, we are once again back at a theological decision to say whether or not the kind of justice stressed by penal substitution is consistent with the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. The same is true for another text that uses a variation of the same Greek word, 1 John 2.2. 2. The ESV and a few other translations use the word propitiation here as well. But again, this is the translator's choice based upon a presupposed theological agenda. The literal meaning of this verse is not necessarily propitiation, though it may be, which we'll get to, but the most immediate meaning is mercy seat or place of atonement. It is a leap to then say that it is necessarily propitiation when the most literal context is expiation. You're adding something into the text to justify propitiation, where expiation is the most clear and immediate translation. Paul frequently makes a point of stating that the atonement is a means of displaying God's justice. So we're once again back at the question of how to define God's justice. Do we define it according to Christ or according to our own conceptions of the law? which in themselves, of course, are biblical. The Lex Telionis is in the scripture, but Christ's interpretation of that tradition uh, should be given more weight. Um, Christ's rejection of the Lex Telionis should be considered a more definitive definition of God and his definition of, of justice. So this verse in Romans 3 does not clearly proclaim penal substitution, nor does the passage in 1 John. The idea that penal substitution is a clear teaching of the scriptures is simply false. There are always some sort of interpretive leaps going on behind the surface. Now, it is perhaps a valid interpretation of the scriptures, but it is unclear that that is exactly what Paul had in mind with these verses. But to claim that this theory in its modern form is inherent to what Paul is saying is naive at best. In fact, um, what I want to suggest here is that it's far more likely that Paul had in mind the idea of God acting in Jesus Christ to cleanse sinners of their sin, to heal their unrighteousness, and thus to proclaim God's justice, which restores rather than merely balances some sort of legal ledger in the name of retribution. So we're again at the question of who is acted upon and who acts in the atonement. Is God the object of the atonement, the thing that needs to be atoned, or is God the atoning one, the one who makes atonement? And I think that theologically we must say, as we conclude in the previous video, that God is the one who does the atonement. He's the one who makes atonement. Atonement does not satisfy something in God, in other words. God acts for our sake, for the sake of humanity, to heal and to restore us. But PSA turns atonement on its head and makes it a case where Jesus acts on God on our behalf, but that just simply is not the case. Now, let's say, even if Paul does mean propitiation with this verse, it still would not mean PSA is correct. Indeed, let's say that we could definitively prove that propitiation is exactly what Paul meant in this verse. Though, of course, it would be impossible to prove that, but it still does not mean that penal substitution is biblical. Because Paul does not say that Jesus propitiates God. Let me say that again. In neither text does Paul say that Jesus propitiates God. God is not the object of propitiation. F, propitiation, is indeed what Paul meant here. And so if you look at this verse again, you'll see that the object of propitiation is not directly stated. It may be God. But that, again, would be an interpretation and a potentially dangerous one. But in the text itself, it is not said that Jesus propitiates God. It simply states that Christ became a place of atonement. Now, even if that means propitiation, the text still does not say that God the Father is the one being appeased or propitiated. Christ may be a propitiation in this verse, but it is not clear that it is God and not someone else who is the object of that propitiation. 
So let's think this through. If propitiation is present in this verse, which I'm not saying it is, but let's just say that it is. Um, and if God is not the one who's being appeased then, because that's theologically problematic, then who or what is the object of propitiation? It is possible that human beings in our sinful and hostile condition are the objects of propitiation. In fact, there is far more biblical evidence to support this reading of the text than there is for the idea that Jesus appeases the wrath of God. For example, consider Colossians 1, 21 through 22, which reads, And you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him. It is not God that must be appeased, but humanity in its sinful alienation and hostility. We are the enemies of God. It is not God that is the enemy of humanity. So this idea that God is a furious enemy who must be appeased by Jesus is less biblical than the idea that humanity itself is hostile and estranged in its mind, and thus that we live in a world of deception, a world of darkness, in which we imagine that God is against us, when in reality God is not against us. We are the ones who are against God. In Jesus Christ, God reaches us in the pit of our alienation, in the hostility of our fallen mind, and he reconciles us to the Father. The primary hostility between God and humanity is not on the side of God. Rather, it is on the side of human beings. We are the ones that need to be reconciled to God. But the point is that it is far from conclusive, to say the least, that there is any biblical text that directly states that on the cross Jesus died to appease the wrath of God, to placate God on our behalf or satisfy some divine need in God for retaliation. As I stated in my first video, this leads to the problematic notion that it was God that needed reconciled to the world, not the world that needed reconciled to God. God is not against us, even when we have been against God. There's a fantastic video by an Orthodox priest that explains the difference between the Orthodox doctrine of atonement versus PSA. So the analogy this priest uses is of two chairs. In the beginning, the chairs faced each other in a fellowship of love and trust. This is the story of Adam and Eve. But the story of penal substitution is that when Adam sinned, in the garden, God turned God's chair away from man. God could no longer face his creation. This continued in spite of humanity seeking God. God rejected humanity time and time again. But when Christ came, Christ was able to turn God's chair back so that God could then be for humanity. Now contrast this with the way that the Orthodox fathers interpret the narrative of salvation. Again, we start with the Garden of Eden, where the two chairs are facing each other in perfect harmony and fellowship. But after the fall, in contrast with PSA, in this version, it is not God that turns God's chair away, but man that turns away from God. And thus God pursues humanity even in our hostility to God. But God is never God against us. God remains God for us. God's chair remains turned towards us even when we try to flee from God. But even if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. God does not give up on us, even in our rebellion. And so the story of PSA very clearly reverses this narrative. So when the two chairs are facing each other, it interprets it to mean that God forsakes humanity. When in reality, it is humanity that turned its back on God. And so God is not the one that needs to be appeased and reconciled. If anyone, it is humanity in their hostility that needs to be reconciled to God. And that is precisely what has been done in Christ Jesus. Now, Gregory of Nyssa said, The unassumed is the unhealed. I quoted this in the first video, but I want you to think here in terms of God assuming our hostility, of God assuming our darkness and rebellion in order to heal and restore us back to God. Because only what God has assumed in Christ, God has healed. And that includes our hostile minds. And so it is possible that Paul, in both of these verses, means propitiation in the sense that God appeases our fallen mind, not in the sense that Jesus 
appeases God. He of Torrance helpfully writes in this regard. Thus, atoning reconciliation began to be actualized with the conception and birth of Jesus of the Virgin Mary when he identified himself with our fallen and estranged humanity. But that was a movement which Jesus fulfilled throughout the whole course of his sinless life as the obedient servant of the Lord, in which he subjected what he took from us to the ultimate judgment of God's holy love and brought the healing and redeeming power of God to bear directly upon it in himself. From his birth to his death and resurrection, on our behalf, he sanctified what he assumed through his own self-consecration as incarnate son to the Father, and in sanctifying it, brought the divine judgment to bear directly upon our human nature, both in the holy life he lived and in the holy death he died in atoning and reconciling sacrifice before God. That was a vicarious activity which was brought to its triumphant fulfillment and which received the verdict of the Father's complete approval in the resurrection of Jesus as God's beloved Son from the death and in the rebirth of our humanity in him. Notice here that God's judgment is seen as a healing act. So in this interpretation, it is not that there is no longer any wrath or judgment. Many think that because someone denies penal substitution, it is simply because they dislike these concepts of wrath and judgment, as if they can just do away with them. But that simply is not true. Rather, for myself, I would prefer to Christianize our concepts of wrath and judgment. That is, to define these solely in terms of Jesus Christ, who is the revelation of God. Thus, God's wrath is not an arbitrary form of punishment. Rather, it is the chastisement that comes from love. It is the no that is ultimately rooted in God's yes for man. Because God is love, the wrath of God is an expression of the love of God. It is not an abstract and arbitrary thing that's rooted in God's self. Rather, it is rooted in the love that God is. And so God has wrath towards us to do away with our sin, to chastise us and to heal us. It is a healing wrath. Wrath is that which burns away that which is not good for us. There is no isolated no of God apart from the yes of God. Another central text for penal substitution is Isaiah 53, which is also known as the suffering servant passage. Um, I remember hearing this read aloud on Good Friday services throughout my youth. And so it really is a central passage that seems to indicate PSA, but as I'll show here, it really doesn't. Verses 4 through 12 are especially central, and I want to read these in the wonderful new translation by Old Testament scholar Robert Alter. Indeed, he has borne our illness and our sorrows he has carried, but we had reckoned him plagued, God-stricken and tormented. Yet he was wounded for our crimes, crushed for our transgressions. The chastisement that restored our well-being he bore, and through his bruising we were healed. All of us strayed like sheep, each turning to his own way, and the Lord brought down upon him the crimes of us all. Afflicted and tormented, he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like an ooh mute before her shears, he opened not his mouth. By oppressive judgment he was taken off, and who can speak of where he lives? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for my people's crimes, bearing their blight. And his grave was put with the wicked, and with evildoers his death, for no outrage he had done, and no deceit in his mouth. And the Lord desired to crush him, make him ill. Would he lay down a guilt offering? He would see his seed have length of days, and the Lord's desire would prosper through him. From his toil he would see light. Be sated in his mind. My servant shall put the righteous in the right for many, and their crimes he shall bear. Therefore I will give him shares among the many, and with the mighty he shall share our spoils. For he laid himself bare to death, and was counted among the wrongdoers. And it is he who bore the offense of many, and interceded for the wrongdoers. It has been frequently debated whether or not the suffering servant in this passage is a prophecy of Jesus, but what we do know with certainty is that this was a central text for how Jesus and the first Christians understood his life and death. 
So it is a vital passage for us to examine. Yet we should also note that the way the New Testament writers used this passage was more creative and allegorical than literal. This is characteristic of how the Bible interprets itself, but it is also common among the church fathers who defaulted to a more allegorical interpretation of texts rather than a literal one in the sense that we today tend to default to uh, with, with a straightforward reading of texts. So we have to pay attention to how the New Testament writers use this passage in order to interpret its meaning for Christ's death. And furthermore, while it is assumed that penal substitution is a clear implication to this passage, that is not necessarily the case. I'll put this verse back up on the screen so you can follow along. First, notice that there is no direct mention of propitiating the wrath of God. The suffering servant does not appease God's legal demand for justice. It does claim that the suffering servant bears the sins of God's people, is God-stricken and tormented, or at least deemed God-stricken and tormented, is wounded for our transgressions, is counted among the wrongdoers, and that the Lord was pleased to crush him. But none of these events are directed at appeasing or propitiating divine wrath, which is the central mechanism of how PSA works. So without this notion of placating God through death, PSA is simply not PSA. Some notion of substitution may be present here, but there is no indication that any of these actions are directed towards God in the same way that PSA is traditionally constructed. Belosak recognized this and writes, To interpret the servant's suffering as propitiating God's wrath would require reading into the song certain presuppositions that would only beg the question. The context gives no indication of God's wrath. Even if we grant the assumption that this verse implies the wrath of God, to infer that the servant's suffering satisfies God's wrath requires logically making the further assumption that God's wrath requires penal satisfaction. Proponents of PSA do not read this text to support their theory. Instead, they read it according to PSA, and thus they misinterpret its essential meaning. But that is to engage in a kind of circular logic. Too many false assumptions are being made here to force this difficult passage into the framework of PSA. To actually exegete PSA from the text, you have to first assume it is there. But that is simply not the case. As we've seen, there is no indication in this text to imply that the wrath of God is propitiated by the servant's suffering. And without this point, there is simply no basis for claiming that this verse is proof of PSA. It is only there if you assume it was there from the beginning. The next point to consider is that just because this text seems to discuss God's chastisement towards the servant, there is no necessary link between these concepts and penal satisfaction. God's wrath is an important subject, but we can say emphatically that it does not inherently lead to the notion of penal substitution. But let's talk about divine wrath for a moment. Biblically speaking, wrath is closer to the notion of God handing over human beings to suffer the evil ends of their own sinful actions. That was Paul's point in Romans 1.18 when he made it clear that the wrath of God is not against human beings per se, but upon all impiety and injustice. It is the wicked deeds of human beings that God is against, and Paul builds upon this by stressing three times in Romans 1 alone that God gave them up to the effects of human sin in verses 24, 26, and 28. So I say all of that to stress that while this passage in Isaiah has been used as proof of PSA, the theory is foreign to the actual text itself and is merely imposed into it. But still, what do we make of the passage that reads? Yet he was wounded for our crimes, crushed for our transgressions. Well, let's think about what this may mean. Is substitution the most obvious way to interpret this? If you are looking for proof of PSA, then yes, you will see this as substitution. But the text does not explicitly say substitution. It says what it says. It says that because of our crimes, the servant suffered. I have suffered for the crimes of other people before, but that is not the same as suffering in their place. If the text had said that he was wounded in place of or in exchange for our crimes, then PSA would indeed be an obvious interpretation. But substitution is not immediately present here. 
So it seems more likely that this passage is simply read as the servant of the Lord suffering the sins of their community, not in the place of their community, but rather by virtue of their sins having effect on the servant. In other words, the righteous man suffered unjustly for the unrighteousness of this world. So it seems more likely that this passage can simply be read that the servant of the Lord suffered for the sins of their community that they didn't suffer in the place of their community, but by virtue of being a member of the unrighteous world, the righteous suffer. But then there's another problematic verse that follows immediately after, which says that the chastisement that restored our well-being he bore, and through his bruising we were healed. Or in the NRSV, which reads, Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. Doesn't this imply substitution and punishment? First, we should note that there is no indication of this punishment being an appeasement of God. The effect of the servant's suffering is healing and restoration. It is not appeasement or propitiation. So it is clear that there is no notion of retributive sacrifice here, but certainly there is a concept of restorative justice, a justice that heals. Now, the second point we have to remember is the context of this verse. Go back to verse 4, which reads, Indeed, he has borne our illness and our sorrows he has carried. If we are looking for proof of PSA, we may say that this is obvious proof of substitution. But again, substitution is not actually in the text. Instead, it is clear that the theme of this passage is that the righteousness of the servant is contrasted against the unrighteousness of their community, and it is their sins which affect the servant. So the idea of the servant bearing our illness and carrying our sorrows does not necessarily mean that he carried them instead of us or in exchange for us in some sort of legal fiction, but rather that he suffered with the community and by virtue of suffering with the community, healing was brought. Now, if we keep in mind the idea of a righteous servant in the midst of an unrighteous community, then these become not an example of exchange or substitution, but of solidarity with the community. The Lord is chastising Israel, and the suffering servant is stricken unjustly while the community is justly chastised. In fact, this is exactly what the rest of verse 4 says. We accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. We accounted. That is the key phrase. Alter notes in his commentary on this verse that in the Hebraic mind, to suffer is to be chastised for sin. And we see that this is also a major theme in the book of Job, and especially the dialogue he has with his friends. It was assumed that if someone suffers, then they deserved it because of some sin they committed. But here, Isaiah is stressing that the community is wrong to think that the servant suffers because of his own sins. Rather, his righteousness is confirmed by suffering unjustly, rather than being contradicted. So that is why the text says, we accounted him stricken. Yet he suffers unjustly from the unrighteousness of others and is thus deemed righteous by virtue of his sufferings. Now, most importantly, this passage still does not include the concept of substitution or satisfaction of wrath. Nowhere is it implied that the servant suffers in the place of someone else or that this punishment they suffer in any way appeases God. There is simply no way to find PSA in this passage unless you go searching for proof of it. And that is what interpreters have traditionally done to support their theory. But it is plainly not present in this text. You will not find any indication that this suffering servant suffered to appease God. A summary of this passage, however, may be helpful to understand what this is actually about. Morna D. Hooker writes, What is being said in this chapter is, First of all, that the servant suffers as a result of the sins of others. The onlookers thought him guilty. But now that he has been vindicated by God, they realize that he was innocent. He suffered not because of his own sins, but because of theirs. If we forget our Christian presuppositions and read the text in that light, it comes across in a new and interesting way. Belosek argues that what's new and interesting about this passage is that it shows that divine redemption confounds human reason and transcends human expectations. Thus, we are often like those who reckoned wrongly that the servant was God-stricken, that his punishment was justly deserved rather than unjustly, that for his own sins he was suffering. We assume that suffering is a form of punishment, but the servant's suffering proves his righteousness. 
God vindicates the servant even though he was counted among wrongdoers. He's proven innocent and suffers the sins of others. We have now covered the three main texts, but there are two that are worth mentioning briefly. The first is from 1 Peter. 1 Peter 2, 22 through 25 is a very interesting one because it connects with Isaiah 53. It actually quotes Isaiah 53, and it interprets Christ's death in the light of the suffering servant. It is notable, however, that the passage Peter quotes from Isaiah 53 is not any of those verses commonly used to prove PSA. Instead, in 1 Peter 2, 22, he quotes Isaiah 53, 9. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. So in Peter's explanation of how the suffering servant passage relates to Christ, he does not focus on the idea that Christ was a substitute for sinners or that God punished Jesus. Because, as we have seen, neither of those concepts are present in the original text. But let's say that defenders of PSA are correct in their reading of Isaiah 53, then why wouldn't Peter at least make that central to his passage here, to the way that he interprets Isaiah 53 in relation to Christ's death? At the very least, this seems to indicate that Peter did not understand the suffering servant as any sort of proof of propitiation even if that idea is present in Isaiah 53. Instead, Peter focuses on how the suffering servant is deemed innocent by God in spite of the fact that onlookers deemed him guilty and thought he was justly punished. And thus the parallels with Christ are clear. The early church was at pains to explain how this man, who was nailed to a tree, becoming a curse for us according to the law, was not actually unrighteous, but righteous. His suffering was unjustly given and actually proves his righteousness rather than unrighteousness. And that is why Isaiah 53 was so important for the early church, not because of some kind of substitutionary punishment that was present in the text, but because it tells the story of a righteous servant punished unjustly, deemed guilty by the crowd, yet justified by God as blameless and without sin. Recall the fact that according to the Hebraic tradition, anyone who suffers chastisement is deemed to have deserved it because of their sin. This was the primary theme of the book of Job, even though it beautifully and creatively debates that tradition by asking what happens if a righteous man suffers unjustly, thus challenging the very idea that suffering is a just punishment of sin. And so they had this issue, what to do with Jesus' suffering. If Jesus suffers, then according to the Jewish tradition, there is one school of thought that says he suffered because of sin. So how is the early church to reckon with this and still claim that Jesus is sinless and blameless before God? It is worth spending a bit more time on this context and note what Gustavo Gutierrez concludes in his excellent book on Job, The World of Retribution, and not of Temporal Retribution Only, is not where God dwells. At most, God visits it. The Lord is not prisoner of the give to me and I will give to you mentality. Nothing, no human work, however valuable, merits grace. For if it did, grace would cease to be grace. This is the heart of the message of the book of Job. But returning now to the passage in 1 Peter, what is clearly being emphasized here is that Christ's unjust sufferings prove his holiness and not his sinfulness. Just as Job wrestled with what seemed to be the unjust sufferings of the righteous, so, so the early church was at pains to explain why Christ's suffering did not indicate sinfulness, but rather righteousness. And this theme continues in 1 Peter 2, 23 through 25. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that, free from sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. For Peter, the death of Christ verifies that he was sinless and justified by God instead of the notion that all who suffer do so because of their sin. So the question the early church was facing was that if Christ is indeed the Messiah, as they claimed, then how is it that he could die on a sinner's cross? Wouldn't that imply that he deserved it? To inject a bit of modern politics here, this reminds me today of the debate in America about police brutality. Whenever a black man is killed by a cop, there are those who instantly jump to a similar response 
to those who denied Jesus in the first century. He must have done something to deserve this death. But if he is righteous and sinless in this death, then the whole system of human-made justice is deemed unrighteous. And so it is the case that Christ's death puts to shame the powers of this world. But more importantly, there is no mention at all in these verses of God being placated by this sacrifice. The importance of Christ's death is rather that we are made free from sin to live in righteousness, that sin is unveiled and condemned in the righteousness of Christ. Another passage sometimes cited to support PSA is 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. In the light of all we've discussed about Isaiah 53, this text becomes much clearer. The little word for in he suffered for the unrighteous is not necessarily the same as suffering in exchange for or in the place of the unrighteous, but rather he suffered with them, suffered unjustly what they deserve, as we saw in the suffering servant of Isaiah. As Belisek concludes with reference to these verses, Christ thus bore the consequences of human sins upon himself, voluntarily taking our injustice and violence into his own body through the cross. So Christ did not die to appease or satisfy God's wrathful need to punish sinners. Sin itself is a kind of punishment, as God gives us over to the consequences of sin. But that is not a legal demand in God, but rather the effects of sin and evil. So the central idea of PSA, that God's wrath must be satisfied and appeased by the atonement, is simply not present in any of these passages. Christ suffers the effects of our sin, yet it is not to appease God, but to heal the sinner by putting to death the old nature and positing a new creation in his resurrection. Again, as we stated over and over again, the atonement is God's activity towards humanity, not Jesus fixing something in God. God is not the object of the atonement. The atonement is the healing of humanity, the restoration and reconciliation of humanity to God, not God fixing some sort of internal contradiction within God's self. Now, another passage sometimes used is Hebrews 10, 12 through 14. And every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. This then continues in verses 19 through 22. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence and enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. In these verses, we see the familiar concept of Jesus as a high priest. So in order to understand that, we have to ask the important question, what is a high priest? And so this is where we need to examine the Jewish temple and ask whether or not PSA is correct in interpreting the sacrifices of the priest as a kind of appeasement. And so while it is something that's still up for debate, most Old Testament scholars, at least the ones that I've read, do not interpret the priestly activities of the temple as a means of appeasing God's wrath. That is not the way that the Israelites understood what the temple was for. The Day of Atonement was a day of cleansing and healing. It was not a day for legal repayment or retribution. Listen to how T.F. Torrance interprets the meaning of the liturgical sacrifices. We cannot emphasize enough then that the sacrificial and liturgical acts were regarded as witness and only witness to God's own action and appointment. The real agent in the Old Testament liturgy is God himself. God is not acted upon by means of liturgical sacrifice. Atoning sacrifices were sacrifices expiating sin in witness to the act of God. In Israel, they are never sacrifices by man in an attempt to placate or propitiate God. It is actually God himself who performs the act of forgiveness, propitiation, and atonement. While the priestly cultus is designed to answer to his act and bear testimony to his cleaning of the sinner. This reiterates a point that we have stressed from the very beginning. 
God is not acted upon in the atonement, but is the actor. He is the one who reconciles and is not the one being reconciled. The duty of the priestly office in the Jewish temple was never about appeasing the wrath of God, but of bearing witness to God's mercy and forgiveness. As we said in the first video, PSA confuses the cause and effect relationship of the atonement. Sacrifice does not make atonement. God atones for sin, and then Christ sacrificed himself freely to heal the sinner. The proponents of PSA, in claiming that the Israelite cultic sacrifice was a means of appeasing God, risk a very dangerous conclusion that these sacrifices are indistinguishable and thus functionally the same as pagan sacrificial rituals. Thus, it is implied that all those pagan gods who demanded the death of children and animals are essentially correct in their understanding of God. The gods are indeed angry and demand blood sacrifice. This, however, completely distorts and undermines the revelation of God to the Israelites as attested in the Hebrew Bible. One of the most consistent themes of the Hebrew Bible is its insistence on separating the God of Israel from all other gods. But to then turn around and say, no, God is basically the same as those pagan gods, that he demands blood sacrifice just as these other gods did, is to so disastrously damage the revelation of God that it is a wonder we have not become pagans. And so proponents of PSA are playing a dangerous game in the way that they describe the temple sacrifice as a kind of pagan ritual to appease God. That is simply not the case. I am yet to read of a Hebrew scholar who argues that the Day of Atonement was a means of appeasing God. So whatever the high priest means in this passage in Hebrews, it is definitely not that Christ died to appease God. And I want to just linger on this idea for a moment because I think it illustrates just how twisted and perverted PSA is and how it distorts the narrative of God's salvation. God is essentially no different than the pagan gods appeased by sacrifice, if PSA is correct. Yet the Hebrew scriptures are at pains to say the very opposite. The God is not like any other God. So on all fronts, penal substitution has come up lacking. Thus, we must drop this doctrine from our vocabulary and strive after a more Christ-like atonement. No texts in the scriptures present a systematic atonement theory. Atonement theories are a later means of interpreting a compilation of texts. But it is a mistake to think that any one single text is enough to base an entire conceptual theological system upon. As I concluded in the first video, I want to stress again that the atonement is not ultimately a theory, but a person. And thus we have to keep central to our thinking the mystery of Christ. The scriptures are unconcerned with atonement theories. As much as they can be a helpful launching pad for us to further contemplate the glories of Christ, the Bible is more concerned with telling the good news of Jesus, because a person is too complex and too beautiful for any one theory. I do not have a theory of the atonement or a theory of God, I have faith in a God who transcends all of my pitiful theories, who transcends all my theology and all my ideas of God. As St. Augustine wrote, if you comprehend it, it isn't God. Now, I hope you've learned a lot with these videos. I am sure that not all of you were convinced by them, um, but I hope that at least more of you are open to the possibility that PSA is unfounded. Um, I also don't want to leave you with an empty vacuum. I don't just want to say what is wrong with PSA and then say nothing about what the atonement positively means. And so in the next video, I'm going to read a bunch of quotes to conclude this series from some of my favorite theologians describing the atonement. And so I want to do this to kind of spark your interest in what the atonement may mean now that we've kind of cleared the air of PSA. And so I hope that video will be helpful. But with all that said, I just want to say thank you so much for watching this, especially if you've made it all the way through these videos. Thank you for sticking with me. Let me know if you have any questions or comments below, and I pray you have a great day.